Rich Baker and friends, my name is Rich Baker, and today my friend is Roger Burroughs. Uh, my God, uh, it is, I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show for like a million different reasons. Thank you for being on. I'm excited to be here. Uh, uh, so just quick backstory, uh, Raj and I met in, uh, January, so very, uh, four months ago, yeah. uh, in a class at Second City, and it was just one of those things, like, the more we got to know each other, the more we're like, oh, you, like, the same, we're kind of the same person in, in, in several yeah. ways. Uh, and I feel like the more we got to, to realize, like, oh, you like this too, or you, you do this, or whatever, it was just like, okay, it's just, it's silly yep. at this point. It's silly. Yep. Uh... <laughs> Just a very brief, uh, you're a singer, an actor, a musician, uh, 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 you, own, you own businesses, I believe, right? Yeah, so I did, you know, I did the musical theater thing for a decade in New York. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years is a long time to be in New York. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but so I didn't, I didn't own the tutoring company, um, but by the end of it, you know, I started out doing private tutoring, like SAT, ACT, oh, high school, nice. whatever. And then sort of by the end, I moved into strategy and operations kind of administrative role. Gotcha. So f helping to facilitate the day-to-day, -day, working with the CEO to like think about the logistics of expanding or collapsing or doing whatever. So. Real, like, like businessy stuff, like stuff that most people who are actors, you know, writers, creators are, you know, waiters or, or, or something like right. that do their job. You're talking about like, yeah, you were in the upper echelons. You were helping form where, where a company goes and how they grow. Yes. That's yes. fantastic. It was, uh, it was super fun. I bet. Uh, so I, the main, I mean, we could talk about anything, uh, honestly, but uh, the main reason why I thought, I thought would be interesting to start is the fact that one thing you and I have in common, which if I have had it in common with someone else, we've never discussed it. You're the first person that I've ever been like, I'm like this, and you're like, I'm like this, and we discussed it, which is the yeah. idea of being um, a man, being right. a, a heterosexual man who also uh, identifies very much with having a, a very large predominant feminine side. Yes. Is that accurate? Is that, that is, I, th I think that honestly, that's one of the best ways to put it, because look, I've we're both in our 30s. We've had a lot of time to think about a lot of different things relating to this, right? Yeah. As like, you know, so like, again, I did musical theater for 10 years. The number of people who were convinced that I was gay. Yep. <laughs> right? And sure. it sounds like really, right? But it's, it's such an obvious thing. And especially like I went to college in the Midwest. The number of men, you know, uh, cisgender men, who came into college straight ended up coming out and the refrain from them was no 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 i know that most people aren't you know straight but i really am straight and yeah. then they ended up coming out and i was like oh so there's just nothing i can do to change your mind cool yeah and i feel like i've i've had a lot of um a lot of male friends, uh, a lot of a lot of gay male friends in my life that I really can identify with, as far as so many things, you know, like embracing the feminine side. But uh, but as as like you know, I'm I'm just, I'm a heterosexual guy, and, but I love the fact that I have this feminine side, and I think it's yeah. benefited. I think I think I resisted it for a long time, and it got me into a lot of <laughs> unpleasant <laughs> times, for lack of better words. I assume yeah. you can relate to that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, it's it's. In some ways, I feel like it's a superpower of mine. Yeah. Because I can sort of play the patriarchy card when it suits me. Yeah. Right? Like, I can... So, for instance, just to go back to the tutoring thing, it was one of the best jobs I ever had, actually being a tutor, right? Mm -hmm. So, most of my students were 16-year-old girls. Okay. Right? So... And especially, you know, later in life, when I stopped being 22, 23, like when I got into my 30s and was tutoring them, I was older than some of their teacher teachers at school. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> right? So I come in, I got the beard, I'm like significantly taller than they are. <laughs> I, by default, I am the authority figure in the room unambiguously. Sure. So I am able, was able, am able to leverage that into really focusing the lesson and like, they're just not going to give me shit. Right, yeah. Like, they're just not. 
right? But anytime I sneak in like, okay, so you remember in Moana when? Remember in Clueless when? Hey, let's look at, I saw the cutest picture of a puppy. Yeah. It like, it breaks this, it breaks the pattern and it keeps the, every interaction I have feels really fresh. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah, I, uh, the way I like to say it, uh, which way less elegant than you, is that like, I can, I can dive into my, my creative, uh, you know, listening, nurturing feminine side, and I, I tend to live there a lot, but I can also bro out. Yes. And, uh, I, and I like both. I really, I enjoy good bro time where it's just like, you know, just like dudes being dudes and, and yeah. edgy and whatnot. And then I like, you know, let's, let's talk about the, the, the book we all just read and, and read some and uh, drink some red wine or yeah. something, you know? <laughs> Look, I think that both of those modes, for lack of a better word, are absolutely crucial to move forward in life, right? Whatever it is you want to do, you have to, at the very least, respect both energies, yeah. right? So the, the, there are a number of analogies, right? But the, the one that I like the most is, um, let's say you have a garden, right? I and you're growing the garden, you got to, whatever you choose to grow in that garden is up to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I get but, it. You know, you know. Nah. <laughs> so you grow in your garden and you have to create space for the plants to grow, mm -hmm. right? And you have to hold that space to make sure that weeds don't get in and birds don't eat it, right? You have to protect that space, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. I think of that as being the sort of yin, moon energy, feminine energy, holding space energy, right? Yeah. Right? But eventually, your little plot of land is likely going to be insufficient, right? At that point, you need the masculine energy, the yang energy, sun energy, to chop down trees in the forest to make a clearing, you know, to yeah. expand the plot, right? Sure. So you want to be able to go back and forth and say, okay, so what am I trying to do right now? Okay, well, right now, I got this thing. I'm trying to grow it. I need to nurture it. Great. Feminine energy is what you need. Once that's good and on its feet, flip over to the masculine, create some more space for the feminine energy to hold. I love it. I love it. I, uh, and, and, you know, I, I think you and I are very much tapped into uh, the balance of both energies, but uh, I have a belief, and I could be wrong, yeah. uh, there's a school of thought out there that really everyone has a yes. balance of both and that Correct. we're it's it's not that you just have this more inherent like biological way of balancing but it's more about like what you allow to be in your life kind of yes. thing yeah i mean look i we we remember 1992 uh marlboro man sure right Th this sort of like exaggerated archetype of masculinity right so I think that, but guys like us, like we're in a really interesting spot as sort of the like late Gen X, elder millennial, catalog generate, whatever you want to call us. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that we grew up with a lot of these archetypes, but as they were starting to get dismantled. Yeah. Right? So we didn't like, look, if we were, you know, let's say 10, 15 years older, by the time these tropes were starting to fall apart, right? I'm just going to use, I'm going to use Will and Grace as an example, right? Like I think that right. that, you know, and Frasier too, honestly, like sure. the nineties were a really interesting time in comedy land, sitcom land to be like, okay, well let's explore gay culture. Let's, let's sort of um, explore the different sides of what it means to be a man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were swirling around with a lot of, things at that time in a way that I think that people older than us were pretty, you know, if we had been our age in 1992, we'd probably be pretty set in our ways. Oh, um, yeah, most likely, sure. Right? As far as like traditional gender roles, whatever, whatever. And if we were 10 years younger, right, let's say we were in college right now, it would be such a foregone conclusion that of, of course there's this, you know, everybody has everything and you know, uh, gender spectrum, whatever, 
but I think that for guys like us, we actively wrestle with it. Yeah. Yeah, we're in that kind of in between, like old, because we really, because we were born before the internet. The internet yes. did not exist when nope. we were, uh, you know, and it wasn't ubiquitous until we were almost adults. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, we really have this like old world mentality and new world mentality kind of going on here. One yeah. thing that I've noticed, um, and I think this, this applies is, you know how like the movies and the TV shows when we were growing up, it was like, there was always like a bad guy or a bad, there was a, or a group of bad, you know, bad yeah. people that were just like picking on people for no reason. Right. Sure. And it, but it, sure. we just expected it. Like, like it's just life. Right. Right. I was on a podcast uh, a few months ago and I was the oldest one by far. Everyone was in their mid to early twenties. Sure. And the, the premise was that we were improvising these characters. And so I brought in like kind of a typical old school kind of like bully. And sure. they were all like, well, bro, what's going on? Let's talk about this. You know? And I was just like, I was like, Oh yeah. Like you, you have a, di like this doesn't fit your archetype. This is a weird thing for you. Right. And also, you know, so I, it's funny. I dealt with, I didn't deal really with any sort of bullying until I got to the workforce. Oh, like, interesting. Until, okay. Like, you know, I, I went to a, a private school in Albuquerque, mm. New Mexico. There just wasn't that much of a bullying. Like there was the really clear, there were really clear authority figures. So like the typical bully thing, the, whole, the only reason bullying works is because they're able to drive a wedge between a peer and the collective authority figure. Right, yeah. Right, so it's like, oh, the teacher's not looking. I'm the boss of you now, right? Right, yeah, yeah. So I didn't, you know, have to deal with that until I got into, like, the office world and dealt with, like, office meme girl-ness. <laughs> okay. But, but I bring all of this up because at that point in my life, I had sort of figured out how to deal with, right? And to be like, whoa, 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 bro, let's talk about, like, yeah. not immediately bowing to the bully. And spoiler alert, I won. Because they didn't know how to deal with my ability to go back and forth between this masculine and feminine, right? Because they were like, yeah. I'm going to leverage masculine energy even though they were women it was very much like i'm the boss i'm gonna punch sure. down at you right but my ability to be like oh i recognize this i understand its opposite and i was able to like in a very feminine way be able to sort of deflect what they threw at me and i was like i just gotta wait because they're gonna complain to the boss the boss is gonna come to me then I will get to tell my side of the story and look like a good guy because I'm just trying to do my job <laughs> and make them look like, right. And I'm like, if I hadn't had all of that time in, you know, 2010, 2012, right. Like the nowadays time. Yeah. I would have failed. They would have out bullied me. Sure. Cause you would have played their game and yeah. Right. Yeah, I got the I got the shit kicked out of me a lot growing up. Uh, so I was uh, I was more bullied in the the like just. I remember one time there was I was in sixth grade and I don't know why I was you know it was school was let out for a little while and I'm at my locker and the hallway's basically empty. This one guy starts walking down the hallway. Uh, I won't say his name, but I remember his name even though we you know it's yes. our only interaction. And he just comes up and he just punches me hard right in the shoulder for no reason we never <laughs> talked before and then just walks away and i mean i was traumatized like it like not only did it really hurt physically but it just felt like so powerless like it's like yeah. this guy who i've never talked to has no beef with me who just wants to let out some tension just decides that it's okay to hit me you know that kind of thing yeah um yeah i'm really glad i don't really deal with bullies anymore and i'm whoo, very happy for it <laughs> yeah you know and i think you know going back to this idea of like the masculine feminine energy like i've i've recently become really attuned to just like you know the the yin and yang of everything right the back and forth whatever right and it's interesting to me that the more you are able to work out all of those different muscles and to be able to feel at least momentarily comfortable in either a masculine mode or a feminine mode and being able to read the room and determine like, no, this is the right 
archetype mode, whatever you want to call it for this moment. Yeah. Right. Those are the people who, at least in my cohort, I see really making moves in their life because they're not stuck in one gear. Right. It's not like, well, I have this preponderance of feminine energy, but I can't, I can't make that turn when the situation calls for it. I, do you see examples of people out there like embracing this idea and like using it to further society or individuals of this idea of like, um, you know, if you have too much feminine tap in your masculine, if you have too much masculine tap in your feminine, that kind of thing. I mean, I've seen it in varying degrees in the wellness space. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, I think the fitness industry has been like killing it lately in terms of understanding the balance between masculine energy and feminine energy. Ooh, fancy. Tell me more. Which, you know, look, I, I recently moved to LA. I've started to take my body more seriously because the roles that I want to do, whatever, whatever. Right. And being sort of at the, what I consider to be one of the epicenters of fitness in the country and health and wellness, whatever. Um, there is a real understanding of push your body and then let your body recover. Yeah, right? absolutely. Right? And, and understanding that the better you recover, the better you're able to then push yourself, right? And look, there are going to be some days when you're not feeling it and you need to pat yourself on the back for getting a 70. Yeah. Because, because at least you showed up to the gym. And I think that that to me, I think is the best example of really being able to understand how to navigate that, right? Because crucially, not only am I just not showing up, I'm also not showing up and saying, I'm just going to stretch today, sit in the sauna, whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there are days when I do do that. But on this particular day, I was like, you know what? No. I don't need to go quite to that extreme of femininity, right? Of, of the nurture yin side of fitness. But I'm not going to 100. Today is not, we're not breaking any records. Yeah. Today, we're just, we're doing the work that we can do in the time that we have to do it. And then I'm going to go home. I love it. And it's such a... It encapsulates it so much, right? Because, I mean, at least, I don't know about in New Mexico, but like growing up in Texas, I very much saw a lot of father figures, male figures. You sure. know, if you were hurt, the answer was get over it, get back to work. You know, yes. like you're fine, yep. right? Whereas, uh, you know, like my mom's energy was the total opposite. Like, oh my God, are you okay? What can we do? Yep. What do you need? And I love the way you describe it because like if you put it in those two, like sometimes you need to just go, we're just pushing through. And sometimes you need to go, no, we need to take care of ourselves. Yeah. And if you are able to play that entire spectrum and, you know, it's funny, you know, we're, we're both improvisers. We do the, the thing. The make them up. <laughs> you know, the thing that I love about improv that at least to me makes it exciting is that it forces you to grow your situational awareness. Right. Yeah. Like, there are things about the improv culture that I don't love necessarily, but you want to talk about a group of people who are aware of the room and can like pay attention to the invisible dynamics of seven people at once. Right. So if you yeah. can have that and be able to play the masculine or feminine game, now you're, now it's not just like, well, today is more rest than not, so I'm going to go all the way to rest, mm -hmm. right? Or today is more push than rest, so I'm going to go all the way to push. Being able to, no, I think today is like a 40%, right? All right. 40% is better than zero, right? Oh, yeah. Well, and it goes against that uh, all or nothing mentality that, uh, I, I, you know, is, oh. is not good. And, and I, that used to be my mentality forever was like, yeah. well, if I, can't, if I can't spend at least 45 minutes in the gym, I'm just not going to go at all. And it's like 10 minutes in the gym is so much better than zero. It is quite literally infinitely better. <laughs> right? <Yeah>. True. True. <laughs> right? Uh, I love it. So, um, Moving from New New York to LA, and I know you haven't been here that long, uh, yeah. et cetera, and uh, part of that time has now been under quarantine. Uh, 
What is what is the different energy between New York and LA that you've that you've noticed that you've experienced? Oh man, that's been like the big thing that I've been thinking about, and it's it's been evolving a lot. Here's where I'm at with it now. Um, LA f- focuses primarily on the individual. Okay. New York focuses on the industry. Interesting. And it was a it was a dichotomy that I hadn't really thought about, but I remember. So much of my stress in New York came from this feeling of, well, if I'm not aligned with a particular industry, like if I'm not the head of an industry, then I'm nothing, right? And if you okay. think about it, we, the majority of us, do not know who the chief, you know, artistic director of the Metropolitan Opera is, right? Sure. Um, I bet you could not tell me. Uh, who who is in the C suite of J P Morgan Chase right now? Not right, at all. because the humans don't matter. It's the industry that they are aligned with, right? Yeah, yeah. So when they walk into a party, they're on a dating site, whatever. They say, "Yeah, I'm actually the CFO for J P Morgan Chase." You're like, "Oh, oh, you're that guy." Yeah, right. The status comes from the attachment to the thing. Exactly. Right. Whereas in L A the status, I mean, you have people who have no clout at all promoting themselves like they're the, they're the greatest thing in the world. Sure. Right? Because the attachment doesn't matter. The energy and the status comes exclusively from the individual. Right? Yeah. So... I am deeply grateful that I went the direction that I went. I think it would have been really hard to go from LA to New York. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, But it's been cool to actually force myself to go, no, 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 Raja, you are inherently enough. Whether or not you, you know, booked a pilot audition or have an agent or any of these other things, like those are not what make you, a creative person or worthy of pursuing this work that we do. Hell yeah. I, you know, I never thought about it in terms of like, you know, where your identity lies, whether it's the thing that you work for or whether it's yourself. But I mean, that makes a lot of sense because in LA it's, it's cool if you're tied to a production company or something, but at the end of the day, it's like, but what have you done? Like when I was at Disney, I did this when I was with Paramount, you know, whatever your your resume is. Um, What did you do when you were there? Not just the fact you were associated with them. Yeah. So in a, in a quarantine world, uh, how are you creating? How are you making your, what, what's, how are you satisfying that um, need? I tell you what, it has, it has been a process. <laughs> <laughs> like forever. I mean, look, those, the first five days. So, so I've, the timeline roughly is like on March 11th, the World Health Organization announced it was a pandemic, mm-hmm. right? The next five, between March 11th and March 19th, I was a mess. (laughs) I'm talking about mess. (laughs) Because it forced me to recognize all of these attachments that I had to external things. Ooh. Right? To brunch. To the pursuit of my career. To writing something to write like all of these things that I was like or going to the gym right I was like oh my god I can't do any of these things and there was I like went through all of the five stages of grief twice in a span of five days it felt like right yeah yeah (laughs) and you know sort of in that process I was like okay well if I can't do any of these things in order to not go crazy, I need to find a routine. And the first thing that I really started doing were these things, that, at least in my corner of the wellness space, we call them blaster videos. Okay. And all it is is it's when you're sitting in front of a camera or somebody and you're just talking at the room. Right? Okay, you're not, like going live on Facebook or something. Exactly, right? Gotcha. You're not soliciting feedback. It's kind of like you're giving a sermon. You're not looking to take, new, take in new information. It's just, here's what I've processed. Here's what I'm telling you. Yeah. 
And it's something I've always loved doing. Um, I love public speaking. I love sharing my thoughts and being vulnerable in front of people. It's terrific. And I started doing that and I was like, oh, this is fulfilling. <laughs> now I have to keep doing this. Oh no, this is fulfilling. <laughs> oh, that's the best, that's the best reaction. Like, dang it, this gives me joy and satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> No, it really was because um, it, was, it was something that felt so self-serving. Even though the premise of it is that it isn't, it's that I'm sharing my observations with people who are looking for solace in trying times. Yeah. Right? But it felt really self-serving. And again, going back to this idea of like institutional attachment, I was like, there's no institution validating the fact that I'm doing this, why am I doing this? And then I had to just accept the fact that I like it, yeah. it's fun, and it's not, it doesn't cost me any money, it's not hurting anybody, like, there's no negativity attached to it at all, so I just need to keep doing it. And I've been doing that every Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Every day, I just talk on Facebook and on Instagram Live for half an hour. That's great. And that's, that's been, I would say, the main thrust of my creative energy because it forces me to actually process what's going on. Yeah, and uh, you know, gives you something to prepare for. Something you've, you've got to talk for you know, 30 minutes, so you've got to have something to say. Yeah. Right? There's... Um, so this was, I, I recently looked this up. I didn't just know this off the top of my head. Um, so back in 2015, Tracy Morgan, right, he got in the, in the car accident. He yep. was in the hospital, right? And then he gave the interview on Barbara Walters afterward. And he was like a changed man. Like this was, it was not the Tracy Morgan from 1997. Right, yeah, right? very different. And he was talking to Barbara Walters. And of course, she's Barbara Walters. So she's going to get him verklempt. But at the end, she was like, what does happiness mean to you now? And he says, happiness is just having something to look forward to. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, oh, I get it. You know, and, I, and it's gotten me to think about all of the times in my life when I didn't feel like I had something to look forward to, right? Yeah. When all of the different things in my life, and sort of the biggest reason I had to leave New York, was I felt like all of the things that I was doing in my life, whether it was auditions, um, being with the same agent for 10 years, going to work at this job that I actually kind of liked, um, my friend group, going on dating apps, whatever it was, all of these things were like chores that I had to do just to get to continue to exist. Right? Sure. And this quarantine time, especially when it comes to like not just tapping in, re tapping into my own creative energy, right? Um, and a lot of people in my cohort have been doing similar things in varying ways, like a lot of people baking or singing songs on Facebook and, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. It's everybody is finding these little things to look forward to, right? Because if they don't, we're all just gonna go nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, see, uh, there was an experiment, I wanna say in the 1940s or something where uh, they, they, they put people in a room, just like an isolated room by themselves. I, I don't remember for how long, but it was like two weeks or something. And most of the people who did it were fine. They were like, yeah, it was boring, but whatever. But the people who went the most nuts uh, and just started to lose it were the people who were in a room without any way to tell what time it was. Yup. The other people would have a clock and they go, oh, they could put a routine in there. They could look forward to wake up, going to bed, and different things like that. But the ones who didn't have, they would just kind of sleep whenever and they were just starting to lose their yeah. freaking minds. And I think as human beings, like we need to have, we need to have something to look forward to. We need to have, you know, d different degrees of per person, a routine of some kind. Yeah. Something. So, so uh, Tony Robbins, big fan of that guy. Yeah, great guy. 
So I say it like I know him. I've never met him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he seems like a great guy. <laughs> of mine. Um, so he is somebody who, in a roundabout way, does kind. He doesn't necessarily preach this, but he is absolutely somebody who I think has balanced masculine and feminine energies really, really well. Because his absolutely, yeah, his stage persona is so. Again, we're gonna get real muddy with terms here, but like, it's it's punchy. It's extra. It's like a lot of that intense sun energy. But when you yeah. see him working with individuals, it is nothing but mama bear holding space. Yeah. So two people, like his job in that moment is not to tell people what to do. And he knows that his job is to hold space and keep predators out while these two humans work out their shit. Yeah. Right. But I bring him up because he talks about the four human needs. Right, uh, and those four human needs are certainty, uncertainty, connection, and significance. And going back to the city of telling time and the quarantine and whatever, we have the human need of some kind of structure. Yeah, some sort of something to orient our day. And I think that you know, because a lot of us live in cities and we don't. You know, we live in places with electricity, uh, right? We can't really rely on the sun to do that. Yeah. Well, right? and there's been some studies going back about, like, how life was before everyone had electricity and how it was after. And it was very, like, we didn't have a lot of insomnia and sleeping problems and whatnot before there were, like, lights. No, because the the biggest thing that I've been thinking about, like, my my, like, driving question in all of this quarantine is uh, how were we meant to live? That's been the big thing for me is like, we're breaking down all these institutions. We are fending for ourselves and we have this extraordinary opportunity to disentangle ourselves, our wants, our ego, our debt, whatever, from all of the external bullshit, right? Yeah. So given that, given that absolute reality, how were we meant to live? And, you know, I go back to saying that this is a process because there are so many, you know, so many things, there are so many variables, right? Like, mm. okay, I, I know that basically every morning, like I'm a morning person. Okay. I, we found something we differ on. I, that's, right? I'll be darned. I am a night owl like crazy. Look at that. We're not the same human We're being. Not the same person. Shocking. <laughs> like, it was something that I had fought for so long being in the arts. Mm. Because the arts is not particularly friendly to morning people. No. Right? But I know that when I go to bed between 10 and 10.30 and wake up between 6 and 6.30, Wow! I have an absurd amount of energy. I'm crazy productive. I don't indulge nearly as heavily in all of my various vices. And I have a greater capacity for appreciating humanity. So, yeah, I think I'm just going to... So win, 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 basically. Right. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't need... To I can't play the I have to be up late at night game and, you know, just to connect. And, you know, for a long time, I thought I had to stay up late in order to have intimate conversations. Right. Interesting. Okay. Right. And it's like, well, if I want, if I want to date somebody, you're not going to, you're not going to have some fun, sexy conversations at four 30 in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rich. That's just not when those conversations happen. I can just imagine, like, uh, working like for one of those phone sex lines in the 80s or 90s and just be like, oh, it's 4.30, no one's calling, we're good. Take five, take five, everyone. Right? The unsexy hour of the day. It is the, oh, or it's the least sexy hour of the day. Yeah, truth. Right? So, okay, when you, oh, sorry, go ahead. You no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Well, so when you said, I'm a morning person, I misinterpreted what you said, because I assumed what you meant was, is that morning is when you liked getting up. 
But what you're saying is, is that if the, when you wake up in the morning, that it's better for you. So does that mean that like was adjusting to going to bed, you know, between 10 to 30, was, 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 did that take effort? Um, somewhat. Um, it did not take biological effort. My body, physically, in terms of like serotonin spikes, whatever, mm-hmm. um, wants to get up at six in the morning. Like, oh, okay, okay. Like my, I, it always has. Uh, it's why I did really well in high school, but not as well in college. Interesting. Because high school starts early, and I was like, oh yeah, I get up at six thirty. Yep, that. That makes sense. Um, really, so it wasn't as much training my body. It was getting rid of all of the attachments and distractions and the lies, so to speak, of, well, if I don't stay up until 1030, then no one's going to send me naked pictures ever. <laughs> okay, fair. Then that's fair. just never, right? And so then again it was a process of digging deeper and digging deeper and being like, okay, why do I, why do I need naked pictures? Like, why do I need to sext with people? Like what, like what is, sure. what, what is the, what is the ghost behind that lie? Right. Oh yeah. I like yeah. It. I'm telling you, man, that's a whole thing. And then slowly being able to dismantle those and being like, wait a minute, I'm doing this. I'm engaging in this behavior that I don't actually like that. I know isn't great for me and my relationships because I believe that I can't get that social interaction, social fulfillment, social validation during any other hour of the day. Oh, okay. That's the lie. So now I can front load my social interaction. Again, part of why I do those blaster videos at 4 PM is to make sure that every day I get that, ping back in and now i'm like would it be fun sure is it like a deep need that like i cannot go to bed until i have a sexy conversation with (laughs) no no it's fine i'm tired i'm going to go to bed that's how my body wants to live and given that there's what seven plus billion people or however many we've grown since the last census uh on the planet Surely there are people out there who are sexually attracted to, to you and vice versa that would be like, oh, I love sending sexy pics at seven. <laughs> right. Split the difference. <laughs> right. Seven is a perfectly acceptable sexy picture time. <laughs> right. Or you could just, just sex with people back in New York and so they're late as you're early and then, then you're good. <laughs> See, you laugh, but... <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, going back to something you said earlier that I just really wanted to, uh, it's something that yeah, I've man. been dealing with a lot lately and really uh, lately, my whole life, yeah. self-indulgence, this yeah. idea of my art is my self-indulgence. So, you know, as, as you know, I've been, and you've been doing the same thing, recording a song uh, yeah. under this, you know, just like guitar piano, whatever, just playing something. And I was really hesitant to do it at first because I was like, why would anyone want to see me? you know, Mm -hmm. play the guitar of someone else's song, you know, or whatever. And at one point I just said, you know what, I I don't care. I don't care if they want to see it. It brings, it is self-indulgent because Mm -hmm. I want to do it. But there's also, the word self-indulgent, I feel like got a real bad rap at one point. And like, it's not necessarily a bad word. No, no, it's, you know, the, uh, it's like the whole, um, it's like your watch, right? It's fine to have it. It's fine to be proud of it. Um, but you don't want to be like, hey, man, look at my watch. Hey, don't, <laughs> don't you love my watch? Right? That's, that's weird, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but certainly, there's nothing wrong with wearing a nice... Like, if you make enough money to wear a $10,000 watch, and that is a thing that you like, and somebody happens to be like, dude, that is a beautiful watch. Thank you so much. I'm glad you appreciate this thing that I did for myself. Right? Yeah. Right? And I think that th- part of why self-indulgence got such a bad rap, I had to speculate, um, is just the culture of industriousness. Right? 
If you're not producing for somebody else's benefit first and foremost, you have no business producing at all. Wow, yeah. It goes it goes right into the masculine feminine energy because eh? Eh? Yeah, right? It's like it is uh, because as one of the things that I think made me stand out as an improv teacher when I started was that I would talk a lot about what it's like from the audience point of view of like what what we're doing up here, we got to yes and each other, but also like we're doing this for an audience and it would be very much like audience driven. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of improv had been more, or at least, you know, not yes. as much about that. Yep. But I think that I went so far into that that I, you know, started thinking like, oh, if the audience doesn't like it, we, you know, like there is, it's too, there's, there's a balance. There's yep. a balance between I got to do this for myself and mm -hmm. I also want to make it pleasant for anyone who wants to watch. Yes. Yeah. And I think that, there is, you know, for the, just to use the example of these covers, right? Yeah. I love watching other people's covers. It's super fun. I don't care if they're good. I don't care if they're bad. <laughs> like, doesn't, it, that does not matter to me. What matters to me is that somebody is putting something out there that, that makes them happy that is objectively not hurting anybody they're not waving it in anyone's face. They're not, you know, it, when it becomes tacky and weird and like, hey man, check out this cover that I did. You know, throwback Thursday, this awesome <laughs> cover. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I, I follow you for a reason, right? And also just, you know, to get like real nerdy and technological now, I think that we have even more freedom to do that sort of thing. Because you look back in the earlier days of social media, there was no way to mute or unfollow or unsubscribe like it just it was very all or nothing right it was yeah oh well if if we're going to be friends on facebook you need to see everything that i post all the time yeah right? i remember going to myspace pages and they were just littered with like there was a song playing and there was there was videos there's music there's was, there was so much crap right and now that just isn't how the technology works and the the philosophy i've adopted is look my online persona is not who I am as a friend, mm. right? Um, there are people in life that I deeply admire. Michelle Obama, Jessica Chastain, uh, Bobby Burke, the designer from Queer Eye. Mm. I do not follow any of these people on Instagram. Okay. Because... I don't like their online personas. Their content does not nourish me, so I do not follow them, but that does not diminish my appreciation for them as people, as artists, whatever. Yeah. And so I take that, obviously, on a smaller scale, but to go, you know what? I am going to trust that people understand the difference between the content that I put out on Facebook as an entertainment media professional and who I am if we have a conversation together. I, I, God, I love that so much because I, I feel like we need those boundaries in this world and I don't think they're talked about near enough or at all. The idea of like, oh, you know, if, if someone you like is, you know, on a, a news channel like CNN or Fox News or something and you're like, I like this person or whatever, um, you might not want to have a beer with them, right? But like what you like is how they present the news or whatever. And they may not ever want to have a beer with you, but like that's okay because they're giving you what you want, which is their news persona. You're receiving it. End of transaction. We're good. It's fine. And you know, look, there are, there are plenty of people who I love as friends who I don't like their media persona, right? And yeah. vice versa. And, and, there are so many people in my life who have unfollowed me, but who I am still friends with on Facebook and speak with regularly. And I love that. <laughs> I love that. And there are also people on the flip side who follow me religiously who I've never had a conversation with. And that's fine too. Yeah. We're all getting what we want. It's different connection points for different people. You have yeah. an audience connection point. You have a friendship connection point. You know, all kinds of different things. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, 
I'm always hesitant to, look, I like boundaries. I like rules. I like clarity. A little bit too much. <laughs> My sure. need for control has gotten me into trouble and has kept me from uh, embracing some of the fullness of life. Get it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Been there. <laughs> However, that clear, you know, there's a, there's a great Fred Rogers quote. Um, literally everything he said was brilliant, but this one in particular. Sure. Um, children need boundaries, right? They need a, the, the sandbox needs walls, right? Yeah, yeah. Because if they know where the boundaries are, then they actually feel free enough to play within them. Yeah. Right? And going back to what we're talking about, like fulfilling ourselves creatively, right? Part of why I feel so creatively motivated these days is precisely because the walls are really friggin' clear, right? Yeah. I am allowed to go to the grocery store, to Target, and the pharmacy if I have to. Right, Those yeah. are the places I am allowed to go. That's it. And I can go, great, cool. Now I'm not wondering, should I go to the gym? Should I try to go to a coffee shop to get work done? Should I try to maybe go for it? No. No, the choice is made for you. The choice is made for me. The sandbox is still pretty big. And so now I can actually play in the sandbox without wondering where the boundaries are. Oh my God. This is, I, I love this for so many reasons. One, because I've got a picture of just someone just pouring a bunch of sand on grass and going, yeah, we couldn't afford the box, but here's all the sand. It's like, well, that's not, it's, that's, that's not, it doesn't work. <laughs> Literally not a sandbox. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's not because the sand's being pretentious or needy and needs. It's just like, that's how physics works. <laughs> yes. I, so my, um, my cousin had, I, this was, I guess, in high school or college. So this was a long time ago. Um, he was like two. No, he wasn't two. He was a baby. And I don't know children very well at all. But he was still the, the like, you right. gotta hold them kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was young and and even less educated than I am now. And I just don't I don't know anything about kids and ever have. And so I had him like on my lap and I was like holding him like kinda under the armpits kind of thing, you know, and he's on my lap and I'm like, Hi, I am in charge of a child, this is weird. And uh he he clearly was like trying to pull away from me. Mm-hmm. And I, not knowing anything, went, Oh, he wants to go over there. I'll let him go. The right. problem is he can't go anywhere on his own. And, and gravity, just his head went bam. And he had like this knot here. And like my mom's here, my two, my co- his mom and dad are here, my cousins. And I'm just like, ah, you know, and it's like, kid, this kid needed me to not indulge his freedom, but to restrict his freedom. Right. And there's always that, like, how much do you indulge versus how much you, you, you restrict? I, you know, and it, it makes me think about, you know, again, I, I, I did not have any children of my own, but going into the homes of these kids that I tutored, like I was a second dad to many of them. Mm-hmm. Cause like my tutoring company charged a lot of money, which means that dad had to be at work all the time. Yeah. Um, so like, I really was like a co-parent in us in a loose sense, right? Um, you were, you're, an, you're an authority, a male authority figure in yeah. uh, the life of someone whose male authority figure isn't there very often. Right, exactly. Um, and it, you, look, it, I learned a lot about just dealing with young people, dealing with students, dealing with anybody in your charge. But the biggest thing that I learned that is that them testing boundaries is an act of curiosity, not defiance. Oh, I love that. Right? It's, uh, no, goodness. Nobody's trying to like, I don't know, is it banging around? If this is when the zombie apocalypse happens, this is how I see it. I'm like, I was interviewing this guy and then a zombie came and killed him. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> no, but you know, it's, I think that so often we are taught, told, whatever, that like, oh, he's testing the boundaries. He's a rule breaker. He's a yeah. rebel. He's a maverick. No, I, I just need clarity. Like, yeah, yes. 
so you know, to, I'm I'm doing these improv classes at um, a place called Second City. You may never have heard, heard of it. it. No, <laughs> but you know, I'm working through the conservatory, and we're finish. I'm finishing conserv Con two, about to go to Con three. We're getting into the realm of like writing sketches yeah you're coalescing your improv into sketch comedy right you put it you're putting the the edges on it right and i i've never enjoyed improv more nice i've never enjoyed it more because it isn't we're not playing calvin ball anymore yeah but <laughs> calvin ball is a short form improv game for the <laughs> i'm i am catastrophically bad at calvin ball i can't do it i, I can't Yes, I can. Yes, and yes, we can have fun. I mean, as, as I am sure that you saw in much of my work, I'm always trying to play some kind of game. Yeah. I'm, because like, a game has structure to it. A game has structure. Once the game has been established, how well we play that game, that's a whatever, right? That's the serendipity magic of improv. Sure. Um, there's a, a quote, and I mentioned, I've mentioned this in a lot of different videos, but I have to mention it here because hey, it is. Yeah, please, please. Um, Keegan-Michael Key, one of my all-time favorite comedians. Hero, yeah. Um, you know, look, I grew up on SNL. I love Key and Peele. I, clearly, Second City is a good fit for me, whatever. But he was talking about the substitute teacher sketch. And he said that what makes the sketch work is that the rules are super clear in the first 20 seconds, right? Yeah. When you go to a basketball game or a pick, let's say you go to a pickup game basketball, we are all playing basketball together. Sure. There's no ambiguity about what game we are playing, how, what kind of ball we're supposed to use, where the edges are. We all know these things, right? Right, yeah. So we can just play basketball for five or ten minutes you know when we're improvising a sketch or whatever precisely because of those rules because of that premise now we can just have fun and play within this and then once we get bored of that then we can test test the edges and be like does that edge have to be here like can we maybe push it a little further yeah right but the bulk of it is very much fun because the lines on the edges are pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. Uh, and as, as far as I could research, this quote is not attributed to any one individual. It's anonymous, but it's learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Yes. Yeah, that's one of my favorite quotes. Like, you got to know where the edges are. Yeah. Then if you go, hey, what I'm making is outside of the edges, great. Then you know where where you're breaking the edges and that's fine, but like know where they are first. Right, I, you know, we, um, in, the, in those seminars that you gave, uh, you know, we talked about Tarantino, right? Yeah. Doing some wild stuff. That dude has watched more movies than like anyone on the planet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about somebody who has just consumed cinema to death. Yeah. Who, there is no, I am confident that there is nobody that knows the rules of movie making better than Quentin Tarantino. Uh, the yeah. only person I might say is Scorsese, just because say, yeah. I've heard interviews with both of them, and all it seems like all they do is direct movies and watch movies. Yes. Yeah. And, Sc the only, and Scorsese is a little older. That's the only reason why. <laughs> yeah, right. But like, clearly, he would not be able to, because he breaks the rules so deftly. Yeah. Every, right? This is And in a way like, that we love. We love it. Right? And you're like, oh, he really just did that. Right? Yeah. Uh, I love it. Uh, sorry, I could talk to you for about a million years, but uh, uh, we're, we're, we're around about the hour mark. What can uh, you plug for anyone who's watching this? How can they find your work? I'll tell you what. Uh, the two best places to find me are on Facebook and Instagram. Right. Um, Instagram, uh, at the Jolly Raja. At the Jolly Raja, right? Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Raja Burrows. Right. Um, you can also find my podcast. It's called Magical Living with Raja Burrows. There's about 12 episodes up right now. Um, I'm on a little bit of a hiatus. Obviously, the quarantine is throwing a monkey wrench in the production of all the things. Sure, um, sure, sure. 
but there there are 12 really interesting interviews with like there's a woman who runs um sex parties and one guy who's an ultra runner and somebody who makes weird wood metal art and we talk about like their creative process their identity throughout all of that um really really cool stuff Ah, I love it. Yeah, and I've listened to a couple episodes. I'm going to listen to the whole catalog, but uh, the the couple I listened to, I was just like, man, you know how to make, like, whenever you talk or interview someone, uh, I I learn, I feel, like, entertained, I feel enriched. I'm just like, yep, bring it on. Just talk to people. I'll listen. I'll tune in. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Uh, So check out uh, at the Jolly Raja on Instagram or Raja Burroughs on Facebook or his podcast, Magical Living. And uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Rich, thanks for having me. Good to talk to you.